Well, hello and good morning, evening or afternoon, depending on when you are tuning into this episode of Edie's Susty Talk, our video interview series designed to keep us all feeling a bit more connected to the sustainability conversation throughout COVID-19 and beyond. Um, and now this is a format that we launched last year, primarily for sustainability and energy professionals. Um, but in the run up to COP26, with less than 100 days to go, we're taking the opportunity to spotlight some new voices. Um, and for today, I'm delighted to have three great climate activists um, on the line with me today. So I have I'm just going to go from my screen how I can see. Um, I've got Emma Wilkinson, who works at Global Choices and coordinates the Arctic Angels program there. I have Inga Ralph, who is the executive director and co-founder of Global Choices. Um, and then I have Zanaji Artis, who is working on um, Zero Hour which is a climate justice organisation, I believe, but we can get into all of these organisations in a bit more. So thank you all three of you for joining me. Um, and I haven't done a great job of introducing everyone, so I think it would be great to start just by introducing the organisations for those who might not have heard of them. Um, Inga, I can see that you're off mute, so I'm gonna pick on you first um, and ask for an introduction to Global Choices, please. Well, thank you, Sarah, and thanks for having us here. Um, a couple of years ago, Sally Rani, my co-founder, and I got together and did a deep dive into the climate space. And we realized that actually there is so little prioritization in, in climate action. Although there's a tremendous amount of activity happening, um, we realized that we are missing a key piece, and that was the Arctic and the melting cryosphere. So we decided really to focus our organization on that. Uh, we called it Global Choices because we do feel passionately that the choices we make now will really determine our future more than ever. And the other piece of it is that we decided it was, we wanted to create an organization that was the sort of organization we've always wanted to work in and that is feminine led, that is generally intergenerational from the get go and so that's how we have built our organization. And I must say, um, it's really paying off. Fantastic. And Emma, I'd love to hear a little bit more about Arctic Angels specifically um, and about how you and Inga work together. Yeah, so the Arctic Angels Network, um, I joined Global Choices in November 2019 when we were just in two countries and we've been building this network together. And it's a network of leading women climate and climate justice activists currently in 23 countries and always growing. And together we're collaborating to drive action to protect the Arctic, um, to raise awareness of the ice crisis um, and to wake the world up to the reality that the loss of the polar ice will impact everyone. Um, and the Arctic Angels program empowers um, the Arctic Angels by um, creating speaking opportunities, um, engaging as an intergenerational community, um, access to interdisciplinary experts, fostering leadership skills. Um, and one thing that we have done as well, um, and we are planning is to journey to Antarctica. And we've been running uh, earlier in the year, a competition um, to travel there, um, as we also want to engage a broader network um, um, and we therefore have Zanaji, who was the winner of the competition, and we were um, we had over 130 applicants to the competition, and in 49 countries. And um, Zanaji was the very inspiring winner with his commitment to climate justice to date. So, I don't know if I'd like to say a little bit more about the uh, expedition and being an Arctic advocate. Yeah. So I can jump in. So I'm Zanaji Artis. I am the policy director and the co-founder of Zero Hour. And um, like Emma said, the winner of the Global Choices Competition to travel to Antarctica. I'm very excited to go in March of 2022 um, as an ambassador with the Arctic Angels Network. And part of my inspiration for becoming a climate activist was uh, the Arctic and this fascination with this remote uh, location and seeing beluga whales at Mystic Aquarium at, in my home uh, in Connecticut was this inspiration for me and learning all about wildlife. And so to travel to Antarctica um, in March will be a really exciting opportunity. 
Um, but my other work at Zero Hour, uh, we are a youth-led climate justice organization based in the U.S. with chapters around the world. And right now, our focus right now is eliminating fossil fuels. And so we're addressing polluting industry, addressing fossil fuel infrastructure in the U.S., and really working toward a just transition to a renewable energy economy, a system where our fossil fuel workers get new green jobs, a system in which there are no more pipelines passing through indigenous lands and um, really making it certain that climate change is this issue that is viewed as intersectional and then is uplifting for communities on the front lines of this crisis. Fantastic. I think I might actually like to stay with that point um, for for a moment, because this idea of a just transition has had a lot of talk over the past year. So I'm based in the UK where we're hosting COP26. So it's been a particular focus for the unit, um, at least in terms of talk, especially with the need to recover from COVID-19 there. And we've actually, as you've mentioned, had some some activism and some court cases going through about polluters pay um, and about stopping fossil fuels. Um, so I wanted to get your view on how, how far we are in turning that talk into action, because we hear a lot of warm talk on it. I'm not really sure of exactly every panel that's going to be at COP26. Um, so I wanted to get your talk on, on whether this look at intersectionality and amplifying voices that aren't always heard is, is turning out. And if not, which I assume might be the case, there's always more to be done. Um, what more we can do at, at this stage? Sure. So I think that a lot of work around climate justice hasn't materialized in conversations at COP um, in the past and right now. And we know that because, I mean, one, right now, even during the COVID-19 pandemic, we know that there's been a decline in invitations for people to attend. Uh, but we also know that this isn't the time to say that we can't have people who are on the front lines of this issue not attending these important talks. And also important to note that organizers have been saying for years that COP needs to stop being funded by polluting industry. We know that um, at the UN climate talks um, at COP26 that Exxon and BP and all these oil companies around the world are actually funding the talks. And so that can't happen uh, if we are actually going to have a just transition and we're going to have youth voices and marginalized voices at the table. And one thing that really can be improved is including youth voices in these talks and having this intergenerational collaboration um, in all the things that governments do. And this is a, uh, a model that Global Choices uses in their intergenerational work. They have the Arctic Angels Network. Then we have adult organizers. We have people who have been doing this work for so long. And that's important because youth will inherit this crisis and we have our futures at stake if we don't act on climate change right now. That makes sense. And we, we will probably have some policy listeners, but we have a lot of listeners from businesses who might be wondering about what they can do to elevate those voices, because I think a lot of businesses at the moment are seeing their role as in better engaging with governments. Um, they're looking at increasingly their lobbying and finances after being called out on that and using their scope X. So I wanted to ask what someone from that um, perspective could do and perhaps Inge uh, or Emma might have a view on that on that one as well. Uh, yes, I, I think one of the things that we have to break down are the silos between business and NGOs, for instance, and activists, because we all have to work together on this and there is a lot to be shared. I came from a commercial background and I really do see there is a lot of um, benefit in cooperation. Uh, there is a lot of knowledge in the NGO environment, for instance, and in the youth movement. I mean, terrific amount of knowledge that could be shared. And businesses can also share a lot of their processes, um, a lot of their access. I mean, many of them have very powerful lobbying elements. And, you know, I think when we're all facing the crisis, um, we have to realize that, you know, let's use all the tools we have. 
So I do think that's really important. So support from business. And then the other piece, I think, is also to understand um, from our perspective and the Arctic perspective is what this means for business, because we tend to think of it as a sort of frozen waste up there somewhere. But actually, the consequential damage is going to be massive and is already being felt. I mean, if you think about that Texas freeze, um, that came from the wobbly jet stream affecting uh, that came from the Arctic melt. And so... As that increases, I mean, literally, we're taking the thermostats off the earth. As that increases, there will be more and more of those events. And that was the most expensive insurance event that the U.S. has ever had. And now we're looking at fires. We're looking at droughts. And, you know, there are massive investments now in regen and agriculture and things like that. And you only have to think, OK, great, I've made this massive investment. But now I might be facing four or five years of drought and lack of water. So we do, and the oceans, fishing, for instance, um, and then sea level rise. So there are so many elements and impacts that will happen um, because of the loss of the Arctic, um, that we would encourage business to really take it seriously and support every endeavor to try and protect what we have. And of course, get to 1.5. I see some some nodding. I don't know if either of you wanted to add add anything to that. Sure, I think I'll also just add that. Um, yeah, Inge mentioned um, insurance and in this Texas crisis here in the U.S. And another major thing that uh, insurance companies specifically can do is stop insuring fossil fuel infrastructure. Stop underwriting these projects that are insurance for fossil fuels and polluting industry, and then also later complain about having to insure um, the people in Texas whose homes um, froze, whose pipes burst because of this climate crisis that was unpredictable. And so insurance companies can stop uh, paying uh, and insuring uh, the fossil fuel industry. And that can go a long way in encouraging a transition to renewable energy as well. And you mentioned there that this is unpredictable, but as, as Inga said, we're in this time now of just increasing wildfires everywhere, proving to us that it is predictable, it has been predicted, um, it's happening faster than we expected, but the predictions are being updated. We've recently had that um, IPCC report, which should hopefully, um, I hope, hammer home to people that um, nowhere is is immune to the impacts, as you, as you mentioned. And Inga, you said that um, perhaps historically action on polar ice has been missing from policy making and even investment in nature based solutions because it, it's sort of as over there. Um, I also read an interview you guys did with EcoAge and obviously it's more complicated. You can plant a tree, but you can't plant a piece of ice. Um, but I'd love to get your take on why historically you think that action has been missing, that there hasn't been that focus, because understanding why there isn't that focus is, um, I presume, important to, to getting it on the table. Yeah, I think, of course, you know, for so many years, it was the frozen waste up there somewhere, right? <laughs> and it was so marginalised, both geographically and, of course, in the imagination. And to be brutally honest, I mean, there are four million Arctic dwellers. And, you know, if we think about them, the significant number of those are indigenous communities. And we know that indigenous communities and indigenous voices have been marginalized and somewhat dismissed. And it's only latterly that a couple of things have happened. One is that, of course, the Arctic is melting or the, is warming at a rate two or three times more than anywhere else on the planet. So we're having a, a hugely accelerated melt of that, of that space, which is of course revealing a lot of riches under sea particularly. Um, and so now it's of much more commercial interest because it's viable to go in and start deep seabed mining or oil and gas exploitation and shipping. I mean, there is a massive increase of shipping planned. And the idea of putting a Suez Canal equivalent across the North Pole, um, just so that we can you know, speed up shipping and get goods from A to B. Massive LNG ports being built um, on the Russian peninsula. So all of this becomes commercially so much more attractive. And so what we're seeing is really basically a sort of a hovering of commercial interest to just continue business as usual in what is the last pristine part of the earth. And so we are saying, 
A, let's first of all protect what we have, which is the central Arctic Ocean ice. And that is technically an area beyond national jurisdiction. So we're saying this actually belongs because it's part of a key part of a system. And we have to start thinking in systems. We are saying this is a global commons. It really belongs to all of us. And so the governance, which has been, and one has to say, pretty well done with the Arctic Council while it was all frozen. Uh, they've managed to keep the peace pretty well. This now is a very different ball game. And so we need a global governance for these areas that are global commons because they affect all of us. And so I think it is really getting much more attention from policymakers. Um, sadly, also in part because there's a huge increase in militarization up there and nuclear activity. So um, lots of uh, scary things, if you like, but also hope if we can mobilize and try and get a moratorium on development in that space just for 10 years and say, look, let's understand what's happening um, and let's protect it until we really know a, more of the science, and B, we really understand the impact it's going to have on the rest of the world. For sure. And I wanted to come on to with that, all that mobilisation involves engagement. And at this point in the conversation, I think we are really looking at how you can get um, that engagement. And I'd like to come on to Emma. I realise I haven't come on to you much, um, but you mentioned about the expedition and the being a way to, I think you said, um, get the work out to a, a broader reach. So I wanted to to hear from you why that is um, such a good engagement tool and what, what you'll be doing in that space. Yeah, absolutely. So with the competition, um, we plan to um, bring our messages and call to actions from the ice crisis front lines um, to thought leaders, to different um, audience. And it's so critical that we engage non-traditional audiences, the missing middle. Um, and the Arctic Angels are a really, really powerful example of this um, storytelling, lived experience of the climate crisis. Um, and I think when a young woman from Uganda or the Philippines is talking about protecting the ice in order to protect her own community, it really does capture attention. Um, I also think the key to engaging um, people is a network of networks, which is really, really the basis that Arctic Angels is based on. The Angels as leading women climate activists, they all have their own organisations or campaigns or networks of which they're part. And when you work with a true generosity of spirit and you're truly supporting one another in a genuinely intergenerational way, like Inga talked about, um, you then have this huge network to engage all of their networks together at critical moments around critical um, issues like the protection of the Arctic. So a network of networks, not, oper not operating in silos um, is key. And then as I kind of touched on at the beginning, non-traditional spaces and also non-traditional voices. And so the Arctic Angels have just been featured in Vanity Fair Italia in the August issue. Um, we were just five of us interviewed for Days Digital. Um, and it's been really, really um, affirming to see how we've had people engaged that maybe wouldn't necessarily have been, that they've been captured by those different platforms and those different audiences um, and are, waking up, as I said at the very beginning, to the reality that the polar ice will impact, um, the loss of it will impact everyone. Great, um, the network of networks makes sense because as I see it, it's like a ripple effect. You touch someone else's life and then that goes out to their network. So you're always reaching more people than you think you are um, in, in that kind of way. But I wanted to come on to the other two and see if they had any other um, advice in making meaningful in engagement and as you say getting getting new people on board and getting those that have maybe dipped their toe in the proverbial water a little bit um, to come on board even even more so. Sure I can jump in so I definitely agree um, with the the storytelling aspect and, and sharing stories in media um, with people that we know with connecting in these networks and that's something I'm really looking forward to in going to Antarctica. I think it'll be an amazing experience to be down there and it'll be life changing for me. But I think also what will be most important is uh, what we do when we return and that story that we share about this, this changing environment that no one 
has has been to that that only so few people in the world have traveled to and can understand and fully grasp. And so storytelling is is huge for for getting out the message for invoking climate justice and ensuring that people really care about these issues. And and other things that we can do include grassroots mobilization. I think that rallies and protests for government leaders of banks who are financing fossil fuels, of businesses who aren't um, doing the most that they can for the environment are really important uh, because young people and our intergenerational allies are paying attention to this and they really want to see um, consumption of of products, of, of finance that is aligned with climate justice and is aligned with environmental protection. And so, yeah, showing up in person, sharing on social media what we're doing, telling our stories, all of that is so important and ensuring that people who are in the place to make decisions, government leaders, business leaders really know um, that it's the people who are going to drive this change and that they should get on board or they'll be voted out. People will choose other products, other services, and that young people are going to lead on this. We're going to be the future and we're going to inherit this problem. So we are really acting with all urgency possible to make that change. Great. And if I could just pose that same question to, to you, Inga, to wrap things up. Gosh, yes. I mean, as as both, well, we couldn't have better examples, really, of the hopefulness um, of getting these stories out because young people are so much more informed than I was ever and so many of my peers. Um, so I, I think that's terribly powerful. I also think this there is a huge power in peers. And I'm constantly amazed at how many people, for instance, in business I've come across who have been to the Arctic. Um, and actually experience this and um, are aware now that this may not exist going forward. You know, 10 years on from here, we may have lost a lot of it. Uh, so the power of peer voices is terribly important for business people to speak to one another and to, to share that. And I, the other thing that I'm constantly astonished about is how few policymakers do really understand the issues. So we have made it our business to do some really good briefs, well-researched, science-based briefs that we can put out and share with policymakers um, because, you know, informed policymakers will make good policy. Uh, and, and so often policy gets made in this sort of vacuum. So that, that's a terribly important one. But I think the, the one that I love is that young people, particularly, I mean, this is well-researched, is, is how young people influence their parents. And we're seeing this more and more. So we, we have a program on education in schools, uh, which is very beautiful, holistic education program um, uh, based on the Prince of Wales' Harmony Education uh, Harmony book. And so many of these young people are going home and challenging their parents. And so many parents are telling us, and, and whether they are politicians or leaders in business or wherever, are telling us that that's made them stop and think. And, and change the way they do things. So, so I'm hopeful because there is a massive groundswell and um, I think we can do it um, and we have to do it. And then of course we have the benefit of organizations like yours and these platforms where we're able to tell the stories and share. And just thank you for asking us to be here today. No, thank you all for coordinating and you're, you're right on timing. I, I would love to stay and chat, but I think that's all the time we have for this recording. So thank you all three of you for your time and for your insight. And I look forward to hopefully catching up again before COP26 and then hopefully when you all get back from from the voyage as well. Super. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.